So I have to uh, make a terrible confession. I'm not a mathematician. Um, I'm more like an engineer. Uh, but I'll talk about a little bit of uh, work, some of which is mine, but most of it is not mine. It's not my work. It's uh, work by uh, people who work at Facebook AI Research and, and perhaps other locations as well. Uh, so since this is about graphs, um, I thought I would talk about graph embeddings and uh, how this is used as uh, kind of a way to do uh, content understanding um, at Facebook and other places. Many, uh, uh, there's many different projects on this in various locations. Um, and at the end, I'll talk about uh, a somewhat different topic that doesn't have much to do with uh, the previous one, although it has some connections, uh, called self-supervised learning, which uh, is what I've focused my research on uh, mostly over the last uh, several years. Okay, so let me start with... Um <coughs> You know, one, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is, uh, um, w you know, what, what people now call deep learning, which is uh, this idea that you can train uh, essentially a network of very simple computing elements that are parameterized, and you can basically train it with surprising uh, efficacy to approximate any function you want from a whole bunch of samples. Um, and that's called supervised learning. So it's very efficient for things like classification, but also for other types of uh, applications. So basically, uh, you have a parameterized function. Um, <coughs> again, you know, it rather that reflects the fact that I'm an engineer, not a mathematician. Um, I put knobs instead of parameters in a formula here, but it's the same thing. So this is a parameterized function. You, you feed it, uh, let's say, an image, and you want to train this function to produce uh, you know, like turn on the red light when it's uh, seeing a, a car, turn on the green light when it's seeing a an image of an airplane, and of course, you know, an image is just a bunch of pixels, so uh, you can combine the values of those pixels in some ways to, to figure out what the function is that maps, that, that classifies cars from, uh, from airplanes. So the idea of supervised learning is you, you feed it lots of examples of images of cars, lots of examples of airplanes. Every time you show an <coughs> example of a car, if it doesn't produce the right output, you correct the output by adjusting the parameters using a gradient descent type algorithm. Very simple. And you do this repeatedly, repetitively with uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions, if not billions of examples. And the magic of this is that if you build this machine, uh, this function, if you parameterize this function in a complex enough way, it's going to be able to not only classify the images that you showed it, but also images of cars and airplanes it's never seen before. That's the, what's called the generalization property, which is you know, something like interpolation or, or extrapolation, if you want. <coughs> and this works surprisingly well if you, if you build those things uh, appropriately, if you have big enough computers <coughs> to uh, recognize speech, so which essentially amounts to mapping speech signals to words or to word sequences, images to categories like cars and airplanes, uh, portraits to names for face recognition, photos to captions, you can generate texts. This is not just uh, you know, a discrete variable, but it can be something complicated uh, or you know, classify the topic of a text or something like this. And uh, what, uh, what deep learning is all about is uh, uh, there's nothing deep about it really, other than the fact that the function that maps inputs to outputs is parameterized, is basically represented by a composition of uh, parameterized, individually parameterized functions, and uh, each of which is, is has some nonlinearity to it. And by cascading multiple nonlinear functions, uh, you, you, you can show that there are certain types of functions that, uh, or you can in intuitively show that there are certain kinds of functions that, are that can be uh, efficiently represented that way. Um, I'll come back to why you need multiple layers. Uh, from a mathematical point of view, if you want, you can actually approximate any function you want with only two layers. Basically, one layer of linear operations, one layer of nonlinear pointwise operations, and another layer of linear operations. So from the purely mathematical point of view, this is completely useless, but from practical point of view, it is very useful uh, because of efficiency of the representation. I'll come back to this in a moment. So the next question you might ask is, what do you put in those boxes? And uh, uh, there is this kind of surprisingly simple way of representing uh, a, a rich family of parameterized functions, which consist in you know, essentially representing any signal you have through a vector or some sort of multidimensional array of some kind. Uh, matrix, uh, engineers use the word tensors, but you know, it's not the tensor, appropriately named tensor. Anyway, multidimensional array. Uh, then you apply a linear operator, uh, a matrix, if the input is a, is a vector. You get another vector, perhaps a different size, usually larger, at least at the first layer. 
And then you take each component of this uh, vector and you pass it through a nonlinear pointwise function. So each component is just passed through a nonlinear function. The simplest one is something like this. It's not differentiable, but uh, it's okay for now. Um, so this is sort of a very elementary, you can think of those as performing an elementary classification if you want. So if the, the weighted sum corresponding to the, corresponding to the dot product of one row of this uh, matrix by the vector is larger than zero, then the output here is positive, basically the identity function. If it's smaller than zero, then it's zero. And that's kind of an elementary switch that determines whether something belongs to, some, to a category or not, if you, if you, uh, if you want. And then you stack another layer of linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. You can stack many layers of those. Um, <coughs> the way you train this uh, is basically just uh, a high dimensional uh, gradient based minimization. So it's just a uh, very simple process. Uh, you, show, uh, you show an image, you run through the function, you compare the output you get with the output you want through some measure of distance, say Euclidean distance if you want. Um, and then you just simply compute the gradient of that objective function with respect to all the parameters in the system, which are all the coefficients in all the matrices in this, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, network. Um, and you take a step in a negative gradient. You do this on the basis of one single sample. Then you show another sample. Again, compute the gradient of the function for that sample. Take a step in a negative gradient. Um, very simple uh, gradient descent. That's called stochastic gradient descent because you don't actually get uh, an accurate estimate of the gradient of the function you want to optimize, which is the average of this uh, error over uh, you know, thousands of, Im of images. You just make the estimate on the basis of a single image and you make an update. So it's a very noisy estimate of the gradient, but uh, experimentally this converges much faster than actually computing the gradients and then making an update um, for reasons I'm not going to get into. Um, so the way you compute the gradients is nothing more than chain rule. That's the most sophisticated mathematical concept that really is used in deep learning is chain rule. Um, and uh, with, it's, it's just you know, a little complicated to wrap your head around it when you want to implement this in sort of very complex networks of functional modules, all of which are parameterized. The one I showed is just a very simplified uh, version of it. And it turns out there is, you know, in terms of uh, computer implementations, very easy ways of representing those networks of parameterized modules that gives you the, the gradient of any function with respect to all the parameters of the system automatically without having to write a single line of code. So you just write the function that computes the output of your cost function uh, in Python or whatever your favorite language is. And there is some you know, mechanism underneath that will automatically uh, give you the function that computes the gradient of that function with respect to anything you want. Um, so, so back, you know, the, the idea of uh, training neural nets like this goes back uh, many years to the mid, the mid 80s, essentially. And back in the late 80s, uh, 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 people like me and others figured out that uh, it's not like you can take a, a whole image, which may be, you know, at the time, tens of thousands of pixels. Now it's more millions of pixels and multiply all the pixels as if it were a vector by a gigantic matrix. It's just too expensive. And so you have to put, make some assumptions about the structure of this linear operator you're going to use, you know, make it a sparse matrix of a particular kind. That's the idea behind convolutional networks, which are universally used today for uh, anything from image recognition to uh, uh, text understanding, translation, and, and all kinds of other things that I might mention later. And the idea of convolutional networks is to basically make the operation performed by those linear operators be convolutions. Uh, so a uh, discrete convolution, uh, for example, let's imagine you have an image here. Uh, you take a patch of coefficients. You multiply the dot product of, I mean, you compute the dot product of uh, those coefficients by a window of the same size. Uh, that gives you a, a, kind of, a kind of weighted sum if you want. You pass that through a nonlinearity and you put the result uh, in a corresponding location. And then you kind of swipe this over the entire image, which essentially amounts to doing a convolution, discrete convolution in this case, and record the results in the output. So that's the linear operator now. So it's got only a few parameters. And um, a convolutional net is, is one in which you, you start with the image, you apply multiple uh, convolution kernels here, which e each of which extracts. You can think of it as extracting local features of different types. And then there is another operation called a, a pooling operation, which basically aggregates the response of the filters within an area and reduces the resolution. It's very similar to the averaging in, in wavelet transforms or uh, you know, the, the, the cross-graining in, you know, some physics models of uh, 
you know, memorization group theory and stuff like that. Um, it basically just reduces the resolution and the result of it, uh, you'll show, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then you repeat the process again. So uh, this is the result of applying convolutions to each of those maps, uh, each of those uh, feature maps with different kernels, summing up the result, passing the result to a nonlinearity, and then doing a pooling and subsampling to reduce the resolution again, and you sort of keep going this way. So this is an example of one of those convolutional nets in action where that's the input, that's the first layer, that's after pooling, uh, third layer, which is another set of um, convolutions, pooling again, convolutions again. I don't show the output here, but um, you can use this to recognize characters. This was widely uh, deployed in the mid-90s for character recognition. Uh, it was one of the big successes of neural nets uh, uh, back at the time. Um, but there was a dark period of about 10 years where people in the machine learning community kind of stopped getting interested in those things for reasons that I don't fully understand. Um, so back in the early 2000s, we realized we could use this for all kinds of stuff, not just character recognition, but also things like you know, driving robots around and uh, um, you know, by using those systems to basically classify if a piece of, of an image is something that a robot can drive over or not, uh, just from lots of examples. Uh, and you know, systems kind of pass through the entire image, you know, produces uh, is its idea of whether a piece of, of land here is traversable or whether it's an obstacle. Then it puts the result in some map and then it can do uh, map, uh, planning in this map to go to a, a particular goal and, uh, and it works pretty well. Um, <coughs> so the, the nice thing about this, this one is that you don't need to manually label all of the pieces of the image because the, uh, there is a, a second vision system uh, based on stereo vision that can figure out whether something is traversable or not, but only for objects that are nearby. So it uses that to train itself. Uh, and then, you know, you can get the robot to drive regardless of whether there are annoying grad students um, <laughs> trying to stop it. They're entitled to do it because they wrote the code and they trained it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you can also use those convolutional nets to kind of label all the pixels in an image uh, by looking at a context around them. You basically slide a window of this convolutional net over the image and, and you, you can essentially train it to classify every pixel as whether it's you know, the road or a building or sky or tree or a person or a car or something like that. And uh, we, we had a system like this working around 2010, uh, which was uh, also implemented on a special piece of hardware that could run it at about 20 frames per second. Uh, this was before uh, things became popular. That caught the attention of a number of companies that started using similar techniques for self-driving cars. So one company called Mobileye that was uh, eventually got bought by Intel, uh, an Israeli company, uh, also Nvidia, and they, they use this in self-driving cars. So if you are lucky enough to have a car that can drive itself on the highway, chances are it's using a convolutional net uh, for doing this at least the recent ones. Um, so what happened in 2012, uh, the end of 2012, early 2013, is, is that uh, our friends from University of Toronto ended up implementing one of those convolutional nets on very, very, very efficiently on uh, GPUs, which are those cards that are, are designed for graphic rendering, and it turns out they're very good for numerical computation. And they ended up uh, implementing a convolutional net that's much bigger than anything that we'd done before, uh, and uh, participated in a competition called ImageNet, which um, for which there was 1.3 million training samples of images among, that belong to something like 1,000 categories, different categories. And what happened uh, there is that uh, the, the state of the art on this data set was something like 26% like error um, uh, uh, on, on, uh, you know, up to uh, 2011. Uh, so this is on a separate set from the one that the system is trained on. Uh, same categories, but different instances of the images. And what this convolutional net uh, did was bring down this error rate down to 16.4%. And all of a sudden, the machine learning and computer vision uh, communities started paying attention to those methods, and they were ignoring them until then. And what happened over the next uh, several years is that people started switching to using those techniques and got them better and better, simultaneously making them deeper and deeper uh, with more and more layers, if you want, and, uh, and got the results, the error rate, down to less than 3%. Uh, it's actually still getting better to the point that it's not really interesting anymore to work on this problem because uh, it's kind of below uh, you know, the error that an average human would produce on this data set. So those networks now are very, very uh, 
large and very deep. They have, some of them have, uh, that are routinely used in industry have 50 layers or so. Um, and there are various tricks in the architecture to, uh, to make them work. And so one reason we can ask ourselves is why is it that multiple layers are good for analyzing natural signals like, like images? And it's probably because the world is, uh, is compositional. There's some compositionality about the world that physicists, of course, know about. Um, but even the perceptual world is, is compositional in the sense that a scene is composed of objects and objects are composed of parts and parts are composed of motifs and motifs are composed of like elementary features like oriented edges and corners and things like this down to pixels, right? So there is this sort of natural compositional hierarchy which is well represented by those multi-layer architectures that kind of learn to, you know, kind of detect those suspicious combinations of features uh, uh, that are more and more abstract as you go up the layers. So there's kind of a matching between the type of functions that can be represented by those deep architectures and the kind of functions that seem to be useful for kind of analyzing natural signals. But it seems a bit like a conspiracy. Um, it just works. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just quickly on sort of the recent progress in computer vision over the state of the art, we can do things now like you know, using techniques similar to what I just uh, uh, showed, using convolutional nets that are swiped over an image at multiple scales. Um, those systems are not just trained to produce a category, but also to produce a mask of the object that, it, that they recognize at every location. And you can do things like this, uh, you know, uh, draw the outline of each person appearing here, including the dog at the bottom, the baseball bats, and, uh, you know, the wine glasses, we're in France after all, um, you know, the people that are partially occluded, the table, the computers in the back, uh, you can count sheep, you can, you know, detect backpacks, etc. So it's, it's amazing how it works, and you would have asked people in computer vision, how long is it going to take us before we can do this? They would have told you, you know, I don't know, 20 years. Um, it happened really quickly. Um, so quickly, in fact, that now we can do things like, uh, in real time, running on a smartphone, figure out the, the, the key points of a human body and sort of, you know, figure out the, the pose of a human body in real time. So, um, <coughs> All of this is open source, by the way, distributed by, by Facebook, and there is, you know, various applications of, of you know, various kind of versions of this for um, all kinds of stuff, but that's technology. Um, so this can be used for, for translation and text and other things because it turns out you can represent text by a sequence of vectors. And that's what I'm going to talk about next, and this is where we are starting to talk about graph, because so far I haven't talked about graphs at all. Um, so uh, when very interesting question here is, uh, is how to embed graphs uh, using kind of machine learning, say SQL methods, perhaps deep learning. Uh, and one question we can ask ourselves is can we embed the world? In other words, it would be nice if you're a company like Google or Facebook, uh, what, you would, what you want is associate a vector to every object that you manipulate, whether it's a person, a user, um, whether it's a piece of content or, or anything, anything in the world that you have uh, that you have to, to deal with, manipulate. It would be nice if you could represent it by a vector because if you could do this, then there would be functions uh, on vectors that you could use to figure out if one person, for example, is going to like a particular piece of content, right? Or if two people are, gonna, are likely to become friends or something like that. So uh, a very simple version of this is, uh, is you know, uses, ooh, that's not very visible. Uh, is uh, matrix completion uh, for graph embedding. So imagine, um, and this was, um, you know, this has been around for a long time uh, with various techniques, but uh, people kind of realize how well that worked with the Netflix competition that took place several years ago. So basically imagine you have items uh, on the columns of a matrix. Those items, for example, are movies, right? You have a bunch of people here. And for some of the entries, you have the information as to whether that person liked this movie or that other person didn't like that movie, okay? Symbolized by this plus and minus. Could be a number of stars or something like that, right? So anyway, this is a graph, essentially, that where, you know, each uh, node, it's, it's a bar graph, really, where you have two sets of nodes, people and items, and then you have uh, edges between them that, that have values on them of some kind. And what you'd like to do is complete this, uh, this matrix. So there is some entries you don't know, and there's some entry you'd like to predict, is this person going to like that movie? or not. And so you could try to figure out, you know, is this person, are the taste of this person similar to another one? Yeah, you know, they look kind of like this person here. So maybe we can sort of 
impute this, uh, this value here as being similar to this person because those two, those two people are similar. But really uh, a very uh, uh, systematic way of doing this is through matrix factorization. So essentially you say, I want to associate a vector to every person and a vector to every item in such a way that when I compute the dot product between this vector and that vector, I get an estimate of uh, that value, whether it's say plus one for plus or minus one for minus, something like that. Okay, and you can very you can do this very easily through stochastic gradient descent. Again, you start with random vectors, and then you uh, you say, okay, how should I change those two vectors so that I get the closer to the value here that I like? So I'm going to bring those two vectors slightly closer together so that their dot product, you know, I'm going to keep them normalized so that their dot product is closer to one. And then uh, here I'm going to bring this vector and that vector a little bit, uh, you know, away from each other, from each other so that the dot product is uh, is more negative, um, etc. It's a form of matrix factorization. There's tons of different objective functions and things like that you can use for this and optimization algorithms. And this can be done at a very large scale. Uh, a, a particular, a special case of this is just using SVD essentially, right? Single value decomposition. But but there are other methods that are kind of slightly more um, appropriate for other types of data. So that's kind of the simplest uh, way of doing matrix completion and basically predicting the edges in a graph. That's what it comes down to. You have a graph, you want to predict, uh, imagine the items are other people, uh, or maybe the same people, and you know who is friend with who, and you'd like to know um, are those two people likely to become friends, because then you're going to propose, you know, this is someone you may like. And Facebook actually has a service that does this. It's called PYMK, people you may know. Um, okay, well, not very visible. Um, so, <coughs> so a very successful uh, uh, form of, of, of this, to some extent, is uh, in the context of what's called unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning for finding uh, vector embeddings for words and text. And there's uh, essentially the, um, this pioneering work in this going back to, uh, to 2003 with Yoshua Benjo's work on using a neural net to essentially predict the next word in a text. Uh, and, um, and then some more recent work by Colbert and Weston, they also uh, use a neural net to, to predict the next word in a text or to, or to do various things with, uh, with text. So basically uh, th there's a form of this that, that looks like this where you feed, uh, you feed a text and you can think of a word as essentially a, a very long vector of size, say, 100,000, dimension 100,000, where one component is one and the other ones are zero. That's called a one-hot encoding. And the one component that's one is just the, the component corresponding to the index of the word in the dictionary. Okay, very simple. So you have a dictionary of 100,000 words. You have a vector of 100,000 dimension. One component is one. Multiply this by a matrix. Basically, it amounts to doing a lookup, a lookup in a table for which... Uh, column in the matrix is going to be activated, right? Uh, and that's going to be a word embedding. Um, so that's the first layer here. You, um, in this neural net, you're going to have, uh, you're going to, you know, have this one hot vector that goes in, that is multiplied by this uh, this matrix, uh, and uh, and produces a vector. And then those vectors are combined in some in some way by some neural net, perhaps of the type that I showed you. Uh, and then you try to predict one of the words in the sequence, perhaps uh, the a middle word that you didn't show the system, or perhaps the last word, if you want to predict what the next word are going to be in a language model. Um, turns out there is a very simple form of this called uh, word to vec where those functions are essentially linear. Uh, and you can't really see the, the, the two models here, but they're very similar to this. You take the words surrounding a particular word and you compute embeddings uh, for those words in such a way that when you sum them up, it uh, essentially predicts the embedding for the middle word. Okay, And you can just learn all those embeddings, all those vectors for every word using just basically stochastic gradient descent, that's what it comes down to. Uh, there's another form here that's kind of slightly less popular. <coughs> um, so those things work amazingly well, either at the word level, even at the group of characters level, or at the group of words level. So there's a, a, a method called fast text, which is extremely popular, produced by some of my colleagues at Facebook, uh, that basically produces embeddings for common phrases, not just for single words, but common phrases. 
And so that allows you to map words or phrases or even sentences to, to vectors, which you can then manipulate. And there is this amazing property that just emerges when you do this kind of training, where you can think of text now as a graph, right? Because essentially what this does is that it tries to do a prediction as to whether a word appears in the context of other words, right? So think of text as a, as a graph. Take a, a giant piece of text and build a graph where every word is neighbor to all the words that surround it. Say, you know, five, five before, five after. And then try to compute uh, a vector representation for each word in such a way that you can, you can predict whether two words are going to be neighbors ever in, in a long collection of text. And you, you train the system on a very, very large collection of text, the text corpus. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, embeddings uh, you get. So the amazing thing about this is that uh, the kind of embeddings you get have this compositional uh, semantics property where if you take the vector for Tokyo and the vector for Japan and the vector for Berlin and the vector for Germany, you subtract Berlin, f you know, Germany from Berlin or Japan from Tokyo and you basically get more or less the same vector. Not exactly, but more or less. So the system has understood what the relationship between a, a country and its capital is, essentially, just by reading tons of text and figuring out that, you know, uh, the name of a, of a city appears next to the same name of, of the corresponding country, generally. And so that just pops up naturally in the, in the embedding. Um, so you can exploit this to, do, to build a question answering system. And this is a relatively old system. There's been a lot of progress uh, on this in the, in the last five years. Uh, that was built by uh, my colleague Antoine Borne and his collaborators um, just before he came to Facebook and then he kept working on this after Facebook. And then the idea is that the graph that you're trying to represent is a knowledge, ba a knowledge base. So the knowledge base is a bunch of entities like say George Clooney and his wife and relationships. He's married to, uh, you know, he's male. Uh, they were married in Honolulu in 1987, blah, 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 blah. So you have this knowledge base somewhere, okay? There's, there's one that is free, um, that now belongs to Google called Freebase. And what you can do is do a, um, you know, kind of one-hot encoding of, uh, of, of those, of those uh, of say, say a, a question, right? So take a question, who did Clooney marry, uh, Clooney ma ma marry in 1987? Uh, you have a vector for each of those words, and, uh, you know, they, in fact, in this case here, they don't even uh, uh, compute a vector for these words. They just, they just uh, uh, represent this sentence by a vector where, uh, of the size of the dictionary, where each, each component is set to one if the word appears uh, in the sentence. So this is a very sparse vector with only a few ones and many zeros, uh, very high dimension. And then there is uh, essentially uh, a linear mapping, a matrix that you multiply this vector by. It's going to compute a vector that will represent this, qu this question. We're going to learn this matrix. And then simultaneously, we're going to take a subgraph here that, w that you know, contains some of the entities that appear here, because um, the rest of the graph is going to be relevant. So you, you take a, a big chunk of graph that contains the, the relevant entities. And here you do the same. You embed this, uh, this graph by uh, essentially a vector that you know, indicates which uh, entities and, uh, are present. Uh, and again, you compute here, you, you, we're going to learn a matrix that maps this uh, linearly to, uh, to another vector. And we're going to compute this in such a way that we, we compute the dot product of uh, the question and the representation of the answer, which is a, you know, a particular arc in this graph, if you want. Uh, we get a high score. Uh, and we'll compute the dot product of a question with something that's irrelevant or is not the correct answer. Then we get a low score, a low dot product, a small dot product. So you, you train this on, on Freebase, and then you can do link prediction uh, on Freebase, basically, uh, and you know, answer questions that you know, may not necessarily be in the database in the first place, uh, because you have some sort of compact representation of, of, this, uh, of, of what answer is relevant uh, in this uh, subgraph using this uh, linear map. This is a very simple uh, thing. Again, there is much more sophisticated things that are that appear more recently for, for this problem uh, using you know, complicated neural nets. Uh, but this can you know, be used to answer simple questions, you know, uh, what are Dallas Cowboys colors, and that's the list of uh, potential uh, answers, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so what can we do with uh, <coughs> this sort of graph embedding representations for language? Uh, and can we use this for translation? So every translation system now that are deployed uh, uh, widely by, by Google, Microsoft, Facebook, etc., use neural nets and they use those representation or embeddings of text uh, using um, uh, uh, vectors essentially, but they, they feed them to uh, a neural nets that produces the translation in another language. The problem with this is that that requires a lot of data. So you have to have very large a uh, very large corpus of parallel text in the source language and the target language. So it's okay if the language you're handling you know, is, is in the dozens or something. Uh, you may have a lot of parallel text between uh, you know, French and English or German and uh, and Swedish or things like that. But you know, what about Swahili and Urdu? There's probably not a huge amount of parallel text in those two languages. Uh, people used uh, you know, something like 6,000 languages on Facebook. And so there's no way we can have translators for every pair. Um, that, that would be you know, 36 million, that's just too many. <coughs> and we just don't have the data. So one question that we can ask is, is there any way that the structure of language can be used to actually produce translation systems that don't require parallel text? Uh, so one idea, of course, is to use a, an internal representation of text that is independent of language. So you, you show the system a sentence in English, let's say. Uh, the first step is to turn this into a sequence of vectors, and then you run this through a neural net that produces a vector or, or a sequence of vectors of some kind that represents the meaning of that sentence independently of language. And then you can run it through another neural net that will produce the corresponding the, the translation into a target language that you want. Um, the problem is how do you produce those? Um, so one idea that uh, popped up very recently, this is work that was done at, at Facebook uh, Research in Paris by uh, Guillaume Lample and his collaborators, uh, and there was a series of papers on this, <coughs> is, um, is to basically exploit the fact that every language in the world talk about the same thing, more or less. Okay. So the structure of language actually is, uh, is very similar. So uh, what you do is you, you find uh, word or phrase embeddings for one language. These are the, the, red, the red dots, if you want, okay, from a corpus of that language. And this embedding is done by uh, trying to predict uh, a, a word from its neighbors, something like that. Uh, it's using the fast text technique for that. It's actually done on, on short phrases, groups of words that frequently appear. You do the same for the other language. And then you ask the question, is there a simple transformation that will essentially turn <coughs> the, the blue vectors into the red vectors? Very simple transformation, like not too much distortion, you know, like an affine transformation, for example. And you might find something that kind of maps more or less. And it's just because, you know, people manipulate similar concepts in, similar in, in various languages. And so there's you know, a cloud of point for a language, a cloud of point for another language, and they may have similar shape. They might just be uh, you know, arbitrarily transformed uh, by the algorithm that finds the embedding. So now there's not two other tricks we can use. One trick is, uh, is to use a language model. So a language model, you can think of this as kind of some, some sort of smoothing. So a language model uh, essentially says, um, I know that certain words can, that a particular set of words can follow this sequence of words I just observed. And so if I'm doing a translation and another word comes on that is not predicted by the, by the language model for my language, it's probably wrong. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of smoothing and error correction if you want. Um, uh, and then there's another trick which is that uh, you can sort of translate in two directions. So you can have uh, to figure out you know, if, uh, if two sentences correspond to each other, you take sentence, a sentence in one, one language, transform it into the other one, and then take a, a similar sentence that you, are, you have uh, that is nearby in the embedding space uh, in the second language and translate it back. And then you know, if you want those two things to be similar, you can sort of adjust the positions of all those embeddings so that the, the thing kind of works out. And so the be beauty of this is that uh, this is the, so people in translation measure the performance of the system with something called the blue score, which I'm not going to explain. Uh, it's, it's imperfect, but uh, that's the best we have. And, um, and what they've done here is um, essentially compare the blue score of a completely supervised system as a function of how many sentences, training sentences, you use to train it in supervised mode. <coughs> 
compared with the performance in terms of blue score of a completely unsupervised system uh, produced this way. And if you have less than a few hundred thousand sentences, this is English to French, I believe, uh, then you're better off using this unsupervised system. If you are more than a few hundred thousand parallel sentences that have been correctly manually uh, translated that you can use for training, then the supervised system is better. So what that means is that you know, for languages with very, very low resources, you can use things like this. And that's basically using uh, you know, kind of graph embedding techniques. Um, there's a cute video that the Facebook people put together to kind of de demonstrate the process, but it doesn't help understanding things much once I've explained this. <coughs> um, OK, now for something that's, uh, that has a little more kind of uh, mathematically interesting concepts. If you can read, <laughs> wow, OK. I'm not sure how this can be fixed. <coughs> I guess it can't. Uh, wow, OK. Huh? Use neural network to denoise the image. <laughs> yes, exactly, to restore the image. Uh, all right. Yeah, you have to activi actively. Huh? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Control A. Control A. What is that going to do? Select all. Select all, mm -hmm. and it will change the color. Oh, unfortunately, that's a, it's a pixel image. I grabbed it from a PDF, so it's. <laughs> uh, including the text. Um, okay, anyway, I'm going to explain. So, um, uh, so there is this idea that um, if a lot of graphs that you want to represent represent hierarchies, hierarchical structures, and using Euclidean distance to embed uh, the nodes of a graph uh, when this graph is sort of a a tree is very inefficient. You need a high dimensional space to you know, represent, the, the, to place the nodes of a graph in a Euclidean space in such a way that the Euclidean distance between points correspond to the graph distance, if you want. However, um, as I think uh, Misha Gromov showed, uh, you can embed uh, trees in two dimensions very easily if you use uh, hyperbolic metrics. <coughs> um, so two dimension is only approximate, right? If you really want to have an accurate representation, you need more than two dimensions, but you can get pretty close with two dimensions uh, already. So why not use a uh, hyperbolic metric uh, between vectors instead of Euclidean metric, and then try to compute embeddings using that metric um, uh, directly. So, um, so, you know, basically, uh, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, the geometry of the data you're trying to represent is not necessarily Euclidean, and you can always embed things in Euclidean spaces, but you might require too many dimensions, and then you lose the kind of regularity and the advantage of using this embedding that, or the generalization ability that it might, it might give you. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, uh, I guess, you can't read it, but it says Gromov 1987. Um, so, one, the idea that uh, uh, my, colleague, uh, my colleagues uh, Max Nichol and uh, Dawei Kiela um, uh, had is to use the uh, Poincaré ball uh, as a model of uh, hyperbolic space. Uh, I hope you can read the formula. So basically you define the, the distance between two vectors. Uh, this, are, this is within the, within the unit uh, sphere as the uh, hyperbolic arc cosine of 1 plus 2 uh, Euclidean distance of u and v divided by, I think there is a square. It's got to be a square. Yeah, there is a square. Uh, 1 minus the square norm of u times 1 minus the square norm of v. Okay, you can't see the square, but there is a square here and here. So uh, in that metric, a, uh, a geodesic is uh, between two points on the, you know, near the boundary is something that is curved. It looks like this. And basically the center is pretty close to, to every point. Uh, so, which, you know, is why. So if you have two points that are far away from each other uh, in the, you know, on the sphere, uh, 
uh, the, the geodesic between them goes pretty close to the center. So now the problem we have is that we're going to have a, co a collection of objects. We know the pairwise distance between some of those objects. And what we want to do is find vectors associated with this, uh, each of those objects such that the uh, Poincaré uh, distance within the, the Poincaré ball um, basically predicts or approximates the, the distance that, that we have uh, in, our, in our graph. So um, you can do this with stochastic gradient. Uh, kind of same similar technique that I was, I was showing uh, earlier for matrix factorization. So you take two vectors and you say, you know, let me compute the distance between those two guys. Uh, the hyperbolic distance, if it's not right, I'm going to, if it's too large, I'm going to bring them closer. If it's too small, I'm going to move them apart. Uh, and, and what you have to do is basically compute the gradient uh, of the objective function, which is, you know, the difference between the distance you want and the distance you get. Um, Multiply this by the inverse of the metric tensor of that, uh, that uh, hyperbolic uh, metric, which in this case is just a, uh, it's a scalar, essentially. It's just a scaling factor that says when you're close to the, the boundary, the, you know, divide by a large number, because uh, even though in Euclidean space, those vectors might appear to be very far away from each other. In fact, they're really close. So you divide by how far away they are from the origin, essentially. Um, and then they use the exponential map to do the learning for, for various reasons. Uh, and you just do stochastic gradient, take you know random pairs, um, and uh, and uh, update them this way. So this is in fact the update rule that you can't read. Um, so one of the things they apply this to is um, is uh, embedding uh, concepts from WordNet. So there is this data, data set called WordNet, which is a collection of a very large number of words from the English dictionary uh, where they are organized as a hierarchy. So essentially they say, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a house cat is a feline and a feline is an animal, is a mammal and mammal is an animal, etc. So they have this whole uh, hierarchy, you know, going all the way, all the way up to entity, which is sort of the root uh, hierarchy. Uh, <coughs> you know, physical objects versus concepts and organisms versus artifacts versus just, you know, natural objects and locations and things like that. And uh, what they did was build a graph where um, basically it's a transitive closure of the hierarchy of WordNet. So they, they essentially have an arc uh, whenever something is a first, second or nth order children, child of, uh, of another uh, node. And then using this uh, Poincaré embedding, they just you know, try to find an embedding that sort of predicts the nodes in this graph, essentially, right? So that the uh, Poincaré distance between two points predicts whether they are children of each other. And you get this, in two dimension, in two dimension you get this, this sort of uh, embedding where, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? You have food here, you have all kind of material things here, wood, hardwood, et cetera. Here you have concepts that are like rate and metabolic rate. Uh, you know, here you have like types of plants and stuff like that and abstractions of various kinds and physical entities, organisms, artifacts, plants, herb, scientists is right here next to herb. Um, <laughs> mathematicians here too. Um, yeah, Gauss is a mathematician. Was. <coughs> okay, so you get, you know, this... Uh, this hierarchy that sort of reflects naturally and you can measure how well this representation uh, can be, you know, how, how good it is at predicting the, the edges in the graph. Actually, you can't tell, but okay. Those numbers are supposed to be the good numbers. They are the best numbers in the table, so you don't need to look at the other ones, actually. Uh, yeah, I really apologize for this. I didn't realize the projector was going to be <laughs> that washed out. Um, you can, of course, use this for social graphs as well, something that Facebook is really interested in, uh, as well as I hope you can, you're can you going to be able to see this. Uh, not much. This is for historical, historical linguistics. So here you take um, a bunch of languages, uh, some you know, existing languages, some of which are uh, extinct. And for most of those languages, uh, linguists have identified cognates, which are words that are essentially the same in the two languages, right, or very similar. Uh, and so if you have the graph of cognates, 
you can try to figure out if there are some sort of hierarchical relationship between, uh, between languages. And what you don't see here is that at the center you have Indo-European, Vedic Sanskrit, and here you have all the Romance languages, uh, Celtic languages, uh, you know, Old Irish and Welsh and probably Breton and things like that. And these are uh, Slavic languages, Germanic languages, Greek, uh, Persian, and uh, Armenian, etc. So they, they sort of mapped out the languages in the kind of, you know, temporal affiliation. Now, okay, so all of those things that I talked about are uh, methods to map, not to kind of map objects to, um, to vectors, but really to kind of pre-compute a vector for every object that you already know. Okay, so um, the, the word embedding techniques I showed you, you have to know all the words in the dictionary before you can, you can start uh, working. You have to, uh, um, you know, know them all in advance. And so basically what you get at the end is not a function that maps uh, words or sentences or whatever to vectors, you just have a table, essentially. But what you'd like, you can't do this for images, right? It's not like you can have a table of every possible images in the world and then have a table that looks up a corresponding vector for that image. So there, there's, there's no way you can, you can use those techniques. What you have to do is basically train one of those neural nets, perhaps a convolutional net if you apply to images, to map images to vectors in such a way that those vectors correspond to kind of semantic similarity or whatever it is you're interested in. Uh, similarly for, for text, you, you'd like to plug a text into a neural net and basically out comes something that contains the meaning of, uh, of that text or the topic kind of similar to the problem I was talking about in, uh, in translation earlier. But it's not just a word, it uh, would be an entire text. Uh, that would be really interesting because with this we could try to sort of embed the entire world, um, you know, have uh, you know, text and images and concepts and videos and things like that that are nearby in this complex space so that we know that they talk about the same thing. So one application of this that uh, has been quite uh, successful at Facebook for the last four or five years is uh, for face recognition. Um, so the idea there is, uh, so this is using what's called Siamese network uh, or metric learning. And it's the idea that uh, you'll have a neural net, one of those convolutional net, things that are, is going to map images to vectors. Uh, and what you have is a graph of similarity of uh, all the images you have in your, in your database. So for example, uh, faces. So you have a, a large collection of face images and you know that this group of 10 images are images of the same person and this other group of 10 images are images of a different person. So now you have a graph that says those 10 images are actually similar but they are dissimilar from those other 10 images that themselves are similar to each other, right? So that's, that's a graph, another graph. And what you'd like is uh, to basically compute an embedding of this graph in such a way that every face image is associated with a vector in which the Euclidean distance corresponds to identity. So two images of the same person will be mapped to two vectors that are very close to each other, and two images of different people will be mapped to vectors that are far away from each other. That's basically what this does using machine learning. So you show two images of the same person, run them through this neural net, it produces two vectors, and you tell them the system uh, in its objective function here, bring those two vectors closer together. So tweak the parameters of, of this network so that those two vectors get closer to each other. Uh, conversely, if, if you only do this, then the whole system collapses. Basically, the network ignores the input and produces a constant vector for every image. So you have to have a contrastive term that says, here are two images of different people, now what I want you to do is move those two vectors away from each other uh, up to some distance, for example, with a, a set margin of some kind. So that's called a, a Siamese net. The idea of it uh, goes back to the, uh, the early 90s, actually. The first papers on this was 1993. But the practical applications for things like, like uh, face recognition is, is very recent. It's uh, uh, around 2014. Um, you can use techniques like this for um, uh, other things like uh, you know fig figuring out if two images are similar by looking at uh, you know uh, you know people post pictures on Instagram for those of you who either use Instagram or have children or grandchildren that use Instagram uh, basically when whenever you post a picture on Instagram you also type hashtags uh, that kind of correspond a little bit to the content and so you can try to sort of find embeddings that would predict the hashtags. If you do this, you get uh, an embedding of images that looks like this. So this is uh, 
um, here a reduction of that embedding to two dimensions, even though the original embedding is much higher dimension, it's more like 4,000. Where you know, in one area of the space here, you have dogs, and then in another area, you have uh, uh, food, essentially, you know, people taking pictures in restaurants. Uh, and then this is the uh, flower quarter, and um, you know, uh, there's people, and that's events. Those are like fireworks, and those are like buildings, and uh, you know, every concept. Now, more recently, uh, people at Facebook have tried to do something uh, a little bolder, which consists in uh, training a, a fairly large convolutional net with 3.5 billion images from Instagram, and they train this uh, convolutional net to predict the set of hashtags that someone would type for this particular image. 3.5 billion images. Um, and if you, if you take this network, um, so there is kind of a layer of classification on top that basically predicts the, the hashtags, right? Remove it, so train this network, then remove the top layer, and then just retrain one or two layers on top to classify images from ImageNet, the data set I was telling you about earlier. What you get in the end is a system that has the best performance on ImageNet, that holds the record. So what that tells you is that if you do very large scale, if you exploit the you know, regularity that exists in the world, it's not task specific, but you you kind of use as much data as you can uh, to train a system to, to produce vectors. And then you use those vectors as inputs to kind of uh, a system that actually does a task, like recognizing object categories. It actually works better than if you train for the task directly, because you never, you never have enough data. Um, OK, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, and I'm, I'm not going to get to uh, self-supervised learning professionally, but uh, this is perhaps more interesting for this crowd. Um, it's the somewhat disconnected from, from the previous things, but again, has some, some connections. Um, it's the idea of generalizing the, the concept of neural nets or convolutional nets to uh, uh, input data types that are not multidimensional arrays, but are functions on graphs. So you can think of a multidimensional array, like say a, an image is a, a 2D array. Uh, with pixel values, but you can think of it as a grid graph where each pixel is linked to its nearest neighbors and where you know the value on the node is just the value of the pixels. Um, and we use convolutional nets on this graph. Um, and what is a convolution? Um, so there is the you know the sort of low level definition of convolution just by the formula, you know you have a convolution kernel that you correlate with a minus sign in front uh, with, you know, all, at all shifts um, with the, uh, the signal you want to convolve. But there is a more abstract definition of convolution, uh, which is a diagonal operator in the eigenspace of the graph Laplacian of your inputs. So essentially, think of an image as a 2D graph. Compute the, uh, uh, you know, where nearby pixels are linked with an edge as, say, value 1. Uh, and you don't have any connections that are um, uh, anywhere else. Now I compute the graph Laplacian of this graph, and compute the transformation into the eigenspace of that, uh, of that graph Laplacian, and that's the definition of Fourier transform. Um, I mean, that's actually how Fourier came up with Fourier transform, right? It's because of, you know, heat, uh, heat diffusion. Um, so, in Fourier space, a convolution is a diagonal operator, it's pointwise multiplication. Um, and so basically a convolution is a diagonal operator in the eigenspace of the graph Laplacian. Now you can define this transformation for any graph, right? So take uh, a graph of any shape, uh, any number of node, compute the graph Laplacian, compute the operator that transforms the, the function on this graph, uh, which basically is a big matrix, uh, Whose number of whose dimension is the number of nodes squared, and it's going to transform the function on your graph into the eigenspace of the graph Laplacian. And now, if you do, if you multiply this by a diagonal matrix, it's as if you were doing a convolution in the original graph. So you can define convolutions on, you know, functions on irregular graphs. Um, so th there's been a, a original paper on this by uh, Joanne Brunat, who was a co-author on it. Um, <coughs> 
Jean Brunau used to, was a, a student with Stéphane Malas several years ago. He is now a professor at NYU, uh, and uh, called uh, uh, Spectral Networks. And, and, and this um, kind of spurred a whole bunch of activities in various ideas on how to kind of exploit this in various ways. Uh, in particular, and so we uh, ended up, uh, oh, this is not the article that I, I was hoping to refer to, but there is a, a review paper here. Well, that's a review paper. Uh, so a bunch of us wrote uh, a review paper um, about this, this idea of geometric deep learning, basically that uh, allows us to apply neural nets and convolutional nets on, on data that is, you know, doesn't come to you in the form of a multidimensional array. Um, and so in particular, you can use this to uh, you know, apply uh, neural nets to uh, regularity networks, social networks, functional networks, 3D shapes. So let's say, for example, uh, you have data that comes to you in the form of a 3D mesh, and you'd like to be able to represent, to uh, you know, feed a, a mesh, a 3D mesh to a neural net and uh, have it recognize if it's a hand or if it's a, you know, a leg or something, so that you can match uh, one 3D mesh to another. Uh, or uh, other applications uh, of this type for, for all kinds of domains. So um, the idea of using the uh, eigenspace of the graph Laplacian has limited practical value because this uh, uh, transformation operator is very expensive. It's you know, n squared, where n is number of nodes in, the in your graph. So it's not going to be practical for images, for example. So you have to kind of cut corners. And this review paper uh, that I was mentioning earlier essentially uh, go through a whole bunch of methods for that kind of makes this practical, either through approximation or through other concepts of how you define convolutions on non-Euclidean domains, essentially. Um, and so people have been uh, uh, applying this to uh, probably one of the most interesting applications of this in, in recent years is, is for chemistry. Uh, so you can you know, represent a, a chemical uh, compound as, as, as a graph uh, particularly as a function on a graph where the value on the nodes you know, correspond to the identity of the atoms, perhaps the, some sort of characteristic of their energy level, number of electrons and whatever, and then kind of feed perhaps you know, two molecules to a neural net that will you know, train itself to compute embeddings that will figure out whether two molecules will stick to each other. So that would be kind of a good way of figuring this out. There's uh, Alan Asper guzik in, in uh, Toronto. He just moved from Harvard to Toronto. who's using this to... Uh, uh, basically synthesize molecule to figure out how you synthesize molecules. Um, there's a lot of really interesting work in this area. Stéphane Mala has been working on similar things, uh, also using neural nets on graphs. Um, so you can have uh, systems that have regular grid graphs. That's a classical uh, convolutional net. You can have fixed irregular graphs. So basically spectral nets that I, I mentioned earlier. And then you can have dynamic irregular graphs. So uh, this uh, application to chemistry is a is a, a typical situation where the, the graph changes for every new data point you get, right? And one molecule doesn't have the same graph as another molecule, so the, you get a different structure for uh, uh, every time. This, there was a workshop at IPAM that I co-organized uh, earlier this year uh, that has a whole bunch of interesting talks about this topic. Um, okay, so um, I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna end with, so I'm not going to talk about self-supervised learning, I'm afraid, but I'm going to end with uh, two things. The first, a question. And the question is, wh what are we missing? So this is uh, what I just talked talked about uh, deep learning is, you know, what people now call AI. Uh, when you hear talking about AI, it's all about deep learning. Um, but it's not like we know how to build truly intelligent systems. And there is, uh, and, you know, I'm asking myself the question, what is missing from uh, the type of learning that I talked about here, supervised learning, that would allow machines to learn a little bit more like humans and animals. Um, and that's self-supervised learning, but that's what I'm not going to talk about. But, um, but then there is a, a bit of a more kind of uh, cosmic uh, conclusion here, which is, uh, you know, given uh, the, the background of a lot of people here in the audience, uh, it's been the case in the past in, in science, uh, very often, not always, of course, but uh, quite often, that uh, new areas of science 
appeared after people came up with artifacts. And those new areas of science were basically derived from the need to explain how those artifacts worked or uh, to kind of figure out what the limitations were, uh, were. So the telescope was invented long before optics was figured out. Um, the steam engine was invented and thermodynamics was basically derived to explain the, you know, Carnot cycles and things like that, right? Um, entropy, I mean, all came up because of, because of the steam engine, essentially. And that became one of the most fundamental intellectual construction of, uh, of science, thermodynamics. Um, aerodynamics kind of existed before the airplane, but not the, the really kind of tricky parts like stability and, uh, you know, lift and drag and things like this. Um, certainly calculators were developed before computer science uh, became a science. And uh, it was also the case for telecommunication that uh, artifacts for that were invented before information theory was developed. So one question I, I have, uh, you know, kind of a scientific question that I'm, I'm really kind of interested in is, is that, is there the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence? Is there a, a sort of general theory of intelligence or, you know, um, intelligent signal processing, call it what you want, data analysis, deriving knowledge from data uh, uh, that, that kind of plays the same role as thermodynamics has played for, for thermal machines. Uh, that's my scientific program for the next uh, several years until by my brain turns to white sauce. Thank you very much. <laughs> When you were uh, uh, marking languages uh, one to the other, I mean, trying to uh, infer uh, an underlying universal language, if I understood properly. So, so can you say something? Else? Did you find some universal properties of languages um, in terms of uh, some <coughs> statistical properties or structures? Or I mean, you, you are assuming that there is a universal. Uh, um, you're, 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 you're assuming that there is one to the extent that it can produce translations of the type that current translation systems uh, produce, which are, not, which are very far from perfect. It's not like the translation problem is solved. Uh, those systems make a lot of mistakes. They're very useful, but they, they don't understand anything about how the world works, other than through the statistical relationship between words, essentially. So they will... They will make very, very stupid mistakes when they translate. Uh, so I don't think we can answer that question, really. <laughs> it, I mean, uh, if you analyze the data, did you find some uh, universality? Yeah. And, uh, say, for example, the... Like the, the Chomsky-style yeah. Chomsky universal structure of language? Uh, so this, is, this basically throw out, th throws out the window everything that Chomsky ever said, in the sense that there is nothing like grammar, syntax, you know, anything like this, other than through their, the statistical relationship of, you know, neighboring relationships of words in, cor in, in a corpus. Uh, so there's no hardwired grammar, there's, there's nothing like that, there's no parsing. Um, so all of this is just purely data-driven. Uh, so if there is some structure, it should appear in the uh, internal representation. I don't think there's been a huge amount of analy analysis, other than, uh, I'm not a co-author on that, on that work, right? Uh, this is work by others. Uh, at Facebook, but um, the, I mean, clearly there is some property there of some sort of interlingua, that's what lingu linguists uh, call this, uh, which is, uh, you know, sort of a, a common internal representation that doesn't depend on the, the particular language you express yourself in. Um, <coughs> I think there's probably years of work there to really analyze what's going on there and to make it better. People are more interested in making it better than in figuring out how it works. Yeah, I also had a question about language. So, so you said how one finds the, the vectors for words. But then one, if one wants to associate a um, vector to a sentence, yeah. does one just take the sum of? Or what do people do? So there's tons of, there's tons of different methods for that. OK, yeah. and then uh, does anybody find any regularities, like the one France minus Paris is equal to Spain minus Madrid, at the level of uh, phrases? Uh, I don't know, actually. Uh, natural language processing is not my okay. application specialty. But what happens, um, 
So this, this relational structure certainly appears when you assume that the vector corresponding to a word is actually obtained by summing up the vectors associated with the neighboring words. Okay? So when you have kind of a linear prediction from the embeddings, then you get this uh, compositional structure. You also get it in, in other types of, uh, of learning. Uh, the general form is, uh, you know, you have uh, words that are mapped to vectors using a lookup table that you train, mm -hmm. and then you can feed this not just to a linear addition, but to a complicated neural net that does something with it, right? That to predict the next word or the middle word or whatever. And there's uh, an increasingly large uh, body of work on this on different architectures, like, you know, the transformer uh, uh, networks and things like that. Uh, transformer architectures and there's like the you know more recent versions of it there is uh, memory networks is those things that have kind of association and attention and all that stuff right um, which I, I didn't get into uh, which which of these ones will you know win out in the end is not clear I think what people are interested in at the moment that's really exciting is uh, trying to figure out representations of sentences that are not task specific. So they would work not just for translation, not just for text classification, but also for everything you want to do with text, question answering, Im uh, information retrieval, you know, all that stuff. Uh, a little bit like the hashtag prediction stuff I, m I showed for images um, that uh, uh, you can specialize for a particular task and then it, you know, it works better than if you just train for this task. So. Uh, this, this idea of transfer learning and meta learning is really hot, a hot topic. No, thank you for uh, this interesting talk. Uh, I had a question: uh, How can topology can uh, make um, CNNs better apart from using graph spectral uh, spectral CNNs and um, and uh, different uh, distance uh, measures? Thank you. So uh, other types of, uh, of representations or, or definitions of convolutions that would not go through the spectral uh, eigenspace? The, the interaction of uh, mathematical topology and... Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, it can make CNN, the first model, better. I see. Okay, there's a bunch of things uh, I think that are interesting in, in, uh, in topology that, have, that are not connected with this. I don't know, actually, to directly answer your question. I have no idea. I don't know if uh, uh, topology can, can help in sort of determining the, the, the appropriate architectures. You know, obviously there are only kind of a finite number of topologies that are going to kind of make sense. Um, whether there are kind of cheap ways to compute convolutions for, for certain topologies that we might be able to exploit, the way, you know, fast Fourier transforms can be exploited when you have a grid graph. It also works if you have a tor uh, toroidal uh, uh, topology, right? Uh, Fourier transform can be defined easily. If you have a sphere, Fourier transform works too. It's uh, spherical harmonics. But other topology, I have no idea. <laughs> um, now there is something else, which is um, <coughs> uh, there's a class of models that people are really interested in that I didn't get to, to talk about called uh, adversarial networks or generative adversarial network or generative networks more, more generally. And those tend to try to find so the, the problem here is the opposite of here is an object, find an embedding. It's kind of the other way around. You, what you want is learn a function that given a point in a low dimensional space from which you can easily sample, let's say a sphere uh, or a cube, a hypercube of some kind, pick a point there, map it through a function, a neural net of some kind, and out comes an image. And, and it's a natural image. And when you kind of smoothly move that point in the original space, you kind of smoothly change the image in ways that make sense, so that you know every every point in the sphere that you run through the neural net will generate the image of a face or a bedroom or something like this. And when you move from one point to another in that sphere, you will change the gender of the person or the age or the amount of hair or the skin color or something like that, whether the person has you know glasses or not. Um, so there's very interesting work in this area that I didn't get to talk about. It's very exciting. Uh, there, I think topology might be relevant because uh, if you take the set of images, all images of a face from all possible angles, it's uh, topologically equivalent to a sphere. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an empty sphere. If you, if, if you use this latent space that doesn't have the right topology, I don't know what happens. It's probably not, not going to work. So I, there's probably interesting things to do there. <laughs>
I think we have five distant talk after the coffee break, so we should keep in time. Thanks Thank a lot you. for this very interesting <laughs>